All right, so it's 1.30. Thank you all for joining us for the AI on the Internet of Things Beyond Crisis webinar. My name is Kirsten Patton, and I'm the Working Group Manager at ATARC. Um, I would like to begin by introducing you to our moderator, Pete Saronis. Pete Hello. is... <laughs> Pete is an accomplished entrepreneur, business executive, and cybersecurity strategist with over 29 years leading a myriad cabinet level and commercial entities. Pete maintains a passion for collaborating with government, industry, investor, and academic ecosystems to unearth and stimulate transformative innovation while increasing private sector commercialization, particularly across the smart and secure cities, communities domain. So with that, I will hand it over to Pete. All right. Well, thanks, Kirsten. Uh, thanks, Tom Suter. Thanks, the Advanced Technology Academic Research Center and our esteemed guests here, which we will get to in a minute. Uh, I'm pretty fired up to talk about uh, or to at least facilitate and even participate a bit in this discussion. We have a unique opportunity over the next uh, hour to blend this research and development world with the crisis we're dealing with today and how technology underpins a lot of not just the mission of government, but the mission that is there to you know, preserve quality of life, improve quality of life. So we will absolutely bridge that gap between technology as an enabler for uh, not just federal government innovation and modernization, but you know, when you think about us as human beings in our lives, the stories you're gonna hear today, the four examples, this is a fireside chat. It's a bunch of us sitting around having virtual coffee. Uh, we're excited to, to be here together. Uh, I'm not a bio reader, uh, because if I did, we'd probably eat 20 minutes into the careers and pedigrees of these amazing individuals. But uh, I'm going to introduce uh, the person, their name, their title, and then we're going to give each of these awesome folks an opportunity to sort of express their passion for this topic, which again, is titled AI on the Internet of Things Beyond Crisis. We're going to dive into a little bit to what crisis means. Um, it's not just with the pandemic. It's it's, it's what's going on in the world and in our country, but technology is not the problem. Technology can be an enabler, but human intuition and ingenuity are critical to that. So we hope to educate, we hope to inform, we hope to enlighten. And uh, again, I'm honored to be here with this cast of folks. Um, we have Brigadier General Matt Easley, who is the director of the Army AI Task Force. The title alone should tell you what it is. He's also a PhD. He's got some awesome ties to Carnegie Mellon University, which was super exciting. Uh, honored to have the general here. We have Doug Nadel, general manager at Sumo Logic. Doug comes to at us from an industry perspective on cloud and its ability to, you know, perform that analytics engine component of the world we're moving to in the federal government, in addition to how to extract insightful information. John Organic, the water sector co coordinator, excuse me, for the Electric Infrastructure Security Council. What an awesome optic to bring someone from that critical infrastructure sector into and provide perspective in terms of how, you know, the water sector, which we think of as Maybe not what we should have, but something that, that um, you know, we need for our life and, and having clean and secure water utilities are, are critical. Joe Ronzio, who is the Deputy Chief Health Technology Officer, not the Deputy Chief Technology Officer, but health is in there with an awesome bow tie. Um, Joe hails from the Veterans Administration, uh, works with, with Craig Lugart. Uh, somebody who everyone knows in this town, in the Beltway, if you're familiar with Craig's work and his service to our country, that's another thing. We've got some patriots here, if you look at their pedigree. So all of you, thank you for your service in that capacity. Joe's gonna bring a wonderful perspective. And really, when you think about telehealth and the internet of things and saving lives and that sort of thing, AI is a critical component for that mission, not just at the VA. And Sam Navarro, uh, not the last, not the best for last, but just one cool cat. Uh, Sam is at the GSA, a patriot, served our country. Uh, you know Sam if, you, if you're inside the Beltway as a communicator, a collaborator, a thought leader. Um, at the GSA, he's doing a number of things. He's officially the director of customer engagement, but Sam also is, is highly involved with 5G and mobility and wireless communications in our country. And again, that will be a component of today's discussion as well. So welcome all of you. And if I can, uh, we'll start off here with John, a uh, little bit of background. Again, you know, your mission and humanize who you are, but why you care so much about, you know, the topic and, and how it, you know, blends itself into your role in the water sector. 
Yeah, I've been fortunate over the years to be able to combine civil engineering, systems engineering, operations research, et cetera. My military background as a Corps of Engineers officer in the Army uh, towards developing plans for things such as disasters, being able to understand the complexity to that extent of the inner dependencies across the variety of components influenced by the environment, et cetera. So I've, for the last four years, I've been working primarily in that problem space. Supply chains also with uh, the critical infrastructures. Thank you. Yeah, and again, you know, none of these folks, as humble as they are, are going to brag about themselves. So I might add some color here and again. But 30 years, uh, you know, John, that's amazing. You know, the, the perspective from being in the defense sector, defense industrial base. And again, I think it's important to emphasize, and for all of you, the water sector is one of the 16 that are deemed most critical in our country. We tend to think of things that, uh, you know, yes, military related and communications, but water. Okay, try to live without water for a while. Mm -hmm. not going to be around very long. So, John, we're excited for your perspective. Sam, a little background there, pal. Yes, well, uh, thank you, ATARC, for the invitation. Um, as Pete alluded to, my career started with the Department of Defense, which I'm, I believe the general could allude to. It's our business to get ready for the unexpected and, and crisis in particular. Uh, so after a stint with the Department of Defense, I joined GSA, where we, quite frankly, cross-collaborate with every agency. And it's our job to bring to the table efficient and effective technology to help agencies better serve the American public. So very much looking forward to the conversation today and just uh, privileged to be a part of this, uh, this panel. Thank you, Sam. And again, shout out to Sam for, again, the role he plays intergovernmental and intragovernmental as well as in industry. His efforts uh, supporting the smart cities work that, that I've been fortunate to be a part of is to be commended. So thank you, Sam. General, also known as Matt, also known as Dr. Easley, and I will call him different topics and or different titles throughout, but forgive me, we're honored to have you. Hey, Pete, it's great here to, great to have this opportunity, and I want to thank ATARC for organizing this. Um, so I come to this with a background in um, both a military career and a civilian career and a career, a little bit in academia, uh, system engineering, computer science. Uh, the vice chief of staff of the Army called me up two summers ago and uh, said, General Easley, uh, we, we know you have a background in AI and system engineering and do we have a job for you? So um, with the AI task force, we have the, the role to try to help bring AI faster to become an accelerator for, for the Army, understand what are some of the barriers? What are we not doing right? What are we doing wrong? And how to fix some of those problems? And it goes everything from, from the data, how do we get the data that we need to make these decisions to make our machine smarter to our talent? How do we get how do we train these people? How do we educate them? How do we give them the tools that they need to do what they need to do? Um, and then as well as goes to our acquisition community, to the internet of things, we, we wanna be pulling data from all these devices that we have, from our soldiers' devices, from our platforms, from our aerial vehicles, to even to all our camp posts and stations. How do we pull all that data in? Because I mean, we, we I mean, the Army, just the Army, let alone the rest of the Department of Defense, owns a hundred different cities. I mean, from Fort Polk to Fort, Fort Hood to Fort Carson. I mean, large city-sized organizations. How do we help them manage their power? How do we help them manage their water? All these kind of things need data, need analytics, need a workforce to, to improve these, to move them from the 20th century to the 21st century. Um, those are a lot of things we're looking at. Again, we're, we, like the GSA, like a lot of the organizations here, can only do a little piece of this for their whole organization. Um, AI, I, we see, is, is so pervasive that we have to help the rest of the Army or help the rest of the government understand how to do this. Um, and that's what we're kind of here as a kind of torchbearer to show lessons learned. So again, pleasure to be here. Yeah, thank you, General. And I think uh, sort of to synopsize a bit of what I just heard is, and we'll, again, express this as one of our themes, is, you know, technology, humanity, culture, culture of your organization, culture in your own family, culture in your city. That, that, that those are very symbiotic. In addition to shout out to you know the the federal government and its IT agenda, workforce for a 21st century, data accountability and transparency, and IT modernization. There's a lot of this IT but mission. And to the general's point, for a lot of it's it's discernible to say, well, the military, I know that mission, save lives. Well, there's a mission in every agency. And newsflash, there's about 450 agencies in the federal government. And 
that's according to the Federal Register. So, so understand the diversity and we represent that in this mosaic of, of thought leaders here today. Doug, I'm gonna pivot to you. Um, you know, you from an industry perspective, but supporting and, and, and serving the, the, the federal government for years and state local, um, you know, from a cloud perspective, from an analytics, can you just comment on some of what you see both on the commercial and the, the public sector side of things and see how, or, you know, how, how, what's that passion for you as you think about, you know, AI yeah. and IoT? Yeah, first of all, again, thanks out to, uh, to ATARC uh, for bringing industry and government together, not only in this forum, but in other forums as well. Uh, Joe and I turn out that we're the, we're the chair of the IoT um, group, and, you know, we welcome others to join that group. Um, what I wanted to mention was just, you know, the, the gratitude I have for the industry. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, I've gone through lots of crises on the industry side. I, I got to tell you, one of my most prideful moments was after 9-11. We don't need to go there. Everyone has their story. But um, again, we've hit a crisis. And you know, the technology out there makes a big difference. Um, today, uh, with work from home, the ability to scale in the cloud, we're actually in a much better place than we were just 10 or 15 years ago. And, and I look forward to kind of bringing some of those um, you know, use cases to light as we talk to the, to the rest of the panel here. But Pete, thank you for your uh, you're volunteering for this as well. You always do a great job. Thanks, everybody. I appreciate that. And again, um, you know, Doug, shout out to the working group and your efforts, your leadership to, to help bring the community together. It's a public-private partnership, a collaboration. We hope today we, we, we glean some of that and, and invite others to, to the dialogue. Uh, absolutely, Nat, last but not least, is uh, Joe, Joe Ronzio. Joe, you know, what is a chief health technology officer, or should I say, as well as the deputy, but, but talk a little bit about that mission specifically and how technology is helping you drive so, change. It's actually a very complicated story for the VA. We actually had uh, public laws that separated technology from healthcare back in 2006. I remember some of the stuff that occurred. And because of that, we have to represent the healthcare side of the house with Craig Lugart being the the chief health technology officer so that we can look at new and on the over the horizon technologies of what's coming out. As we're talking about AI being involved, the, a major mission of mine for the past over 10 years has been how do we get the sensors out there to replicate what the doctor's sensing capability is when he's in person. So as we talk about telehealth technologies, we're talking about that distance that's in place so that the provider is not seeing, touching, smelling what's going on with the patient. And he has to actually rely on data feeds or a ver visual like we are right now, um, distance technology to be able to interpret what's going on in that individual's physiology. And that's difficult unto itself right now. Again, the technology has matured significantly over the past 30 years that telehealth has been around in the VA but we still have to refine it even better. But once we have all that data, the what to do with it becomes the next challenge. We can't have doctors reading reams of data, which is what <laughs> most are doing today. So we've got to create the systems in place that could be data filters. And that's obviously where the artificial intelligence comes into play. Well, with that said, that was for our audience, uh, hopefully a taste of, of what kind of collective wisdoms here. Uh, I'm going to jump right in and we're going to start with Sam, um, just to give you that little prequel. Uh, we're going to talk to what we know is, is evident. You know, the title of this, this webinar is A Crisis. We are living a crisis never seen before. It's uh, something every day we get up and look and hope to hear good news, but really know that there is an end somewhere, we just don't know, and that's kind of scary. Technology, uh, when you think of this new normal, um, Sam, what, what is the feeling at the GSA? How is that culture addressing, both on an informational sharing perspective, but how is it you know, made life different for the worker at GSA? What are you finding technology enabling the agency to do to keep its, its mission rolling along? And we're gonna ask that to everybody. And well, first and foremost, we've seen that uh, this crisis in particular has impacted not only one, but many verticals, right? Yeah. So technology being one of them. And one of the key aspects that we leverage technology in particular in today, as Joe alluded to, is to turn data into knowledge, which we can then turn around and make uh, decisions on how to de best deploy the resources we have, whether you're in the health sector, uh, the defense sector, or, or really... Uh, 
providing value to the taxpayer in any other kind of uh, element. And so a lot of agencies really in this situation of crisis say, you know, great, we had the CARES Act passed, which gave us a little bit of a increased ability to, to, to have the buying power we needed to buy the capabilities we have, but you still try to leverage efficiencies. And so in leveraging the capabilities that are at hand, this concept of dual use really has come center stage as agencies look to procure the capabilities, whether it's to have a mobile workforce or to uh, make rapid decisions on how to strategically deploy their resources. And what we see is a private public kind of partnership in thinking about the capabilities you need from a dual use perspective, where you're buying into capabilities that already exist, and then using that buying power to efficiently get the capabilities you need rapidly versus having to go through a extensive R&D process to get a capability in place it, uh, it, later on. Yeah, Sam, I, I'm hearing it speaks to that the government, which spends $90 billion a year every year to support its IT environment, that's people, process, and technology, but to leverage a lot of what we have. And I think we're being called out you know, a bit to say, what, what resources have we invested in versus getting that next thing? Because now we're living in this remote world and we have to take advantage of those capabilities. So great points. Um, you know, General, uh, the Jake, uh, the defense does a lot of, you know, pioneering and trailblazing and, and folks look to the DOD. Can you share some of this new normal's impact on, on the DOD and its mission to embrace some of that technology and provide that information sharing nexus for the rest of government? Sure, so within the Department of Defense, especially in the Army, we have really leveraged um, online tools. I mean, this has really helped transform it. It wasn't as if we didn't have these tools before, but we just didn't use these tools at the same level that a lot of commercial industry did. We had a lot more in-face in meetings, a lot of more group meetings. I mean, everybody huddled around in the motor pool or training in, I mean, in, in a normal classroom environment. And we've dramatically changed that now. So huge amount of trainings done online, uh, meetings are done online. I mean, even in our in Army Futures Command headquarters in downtown Austin, I mean, they, they have meetings all the time, but most people are taking them from their office or doing them at smaller groups. We do those same type of meetings with the Pentagon, same type of meetings with the Jake. So we, we see this kind of as the new normal, at least until a, a vaccine is out for, for COVID-19. But I, we really see within Army Futures Command and my team in particular, um, dramatic, increases of, of efficiency i mean how to how to have the culture to be able to work in this type of environment has made us more efficient um, being able to use online tools um, scheduling systems um, knowledge sharing devices all all have increased our efficiency significantly and that's not just at this level but a lot of our our systems as well i mean for cutting orders and um, all those type of personnel systems a lot of that's all being done virtual now so it's seeing great improvements for us yeah, and, and again, we, we forget sometimes that basic communications, which is again, one of those sectors, it's we have to be able to use these tools, we have to be able to leverage these. And, you know, it's forced a lot of us into, wow, it can work. And, uh, you know, again, regardless, defense, water, energy, I think, you know, that that's important. That's, that's good to hear. And, and uh, it doesn't matter where you are, you know, you're one. Well, but for, I mean, the Army in particular, I mean, I just, we just didn't have a culture of teleworking. I, I know a lot of Silicon Valley companies do, but for the Army, we have we at least short term embraced it. And I think, I mean, it's, we, we see us here working wh wherever you happen to be, if you're in a remote office at your home or at your, your physical office. So. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. Good points. John, um, you know, from an industry, what, what are your thoughts on this, this new normal and how has it influenced the uh, sector that you're working in? Well, a lot of the preparation for uh, operating these complex infrastructures has already been laid down and put in place. Um, with sensors and PLCs and just being able to collect and remotely operate many of the systems. Uh, so in that regard, uh, the, the people are prepared. On the other hand, there is still a demand for people to do things, get into holes, fix pipes, et cetera. So you can never get away really truly uh, with some kind of a technological solution. But for the most part, the technologies themselves uh, have been able to help uh, operate some of these uh, water systems, uh, utility systems in that regard. Yeah, you know, you, you, you broached the uh, industrial control system vernacular. Uh, you referenced mm -hmm. PLCs, project, program logic controllers. For those of you who are watching and want to Google, that's, 
kind of that world that, that is the infrastructure that's typically owned and operated by certain utility sectors and so forth. And that's a different world than the IT, the internet world, and we're seeing a convergence. And sensors is a word we've used today. Robotics have been words we've used today. So to our audience, um, you know, if this was a free flow with our audience, I'm sure there'd be calls saying, hey, how's AI being used to, you know, to fight wars? How's AI used to you know, keep our water clean? We hope the audience, or I hope the audience at least gleans that some of this stuff you're gonna hear today, you're gonna need to research. You're gonna need yeah. to understand can, that, go ahead. Manage. You can manage and operate uh, kind of remotely in many different ways. Right. Uh, sometimes you have to operate in a way, though, or at least you have to continue to maintain that idea of risk or you might lose the system or the controls over the SCADA or the ICS, the industrial control system. But sure. for the most part, you can start to, to see where this comes in handy. Yeah, you know, so we're going to segue down to Joe and then over to um, my buddy Doug here is cyber physical risk, mitigating risk, right? No silver bullet. I think we could all, and we're all nodding heads that there's no one solution to mitigate risk by introduction of the internet protocol. Um, Joe, telehealth, remote sensing. I mean, healthcare is at the center of this COVID-19 and, and, you know, maybe now we have eyes on what the hospital of the future either looks like today and has been and we just didn't realize it or where it needs to get to. Can you speak a little bit to that and how AI is driving a lot of the healthcare innovation? So right now, we've been working to ensure that part of our practice has always been part of telehealth. So every physician who poss possibly can has a telehealth clinic within VA already. So let's just move the needle a little bit in rushing things so that we can get more services offered to veterans and more capability out there. We're still working to kind of develop those analytics logics with AI. I've been working with multiple vendors, having multiple calls every day right now. There is no silver bullet. So there is no one system that can solve everything right now. There are some systems that do decision support. They work very well in mitigating risk for providers, but we're still trying to, again, move that needle over. That's why, as Doug mentioned, I'm, one, I'm the government chair for the AI, IoT AI committee within ATARC because I feel that that's one of those areas that we can have tremendous impact over the next five and 10 years. And maybe we'll compress that schedule a bit because we're seeing this happening. So we're getting more patients on our telehealth clinics. And right now, if you look at any website, you're probably getting an ad of some sort for some sort of telehealth capability from your hospital or your medical practice down the street. And I'd say six months ago, that wasn't the case. Well, you know, you were jumping, you know, into an area that really was the segue over to, to Doug, and that's the public-private partnership, right? Our audience, the Beltway, it's a very dynamic buy-sell mentality. I always like to preach it's more about seeker-solver, who has something that can solve a problem, and do you even know our problem? So, Doug, can you speak yeah. a bit to, uh, you know, I know Sumo Logic, great company, yeah. cloud-based analytics, machine learning. What, what is that differentiator you feel that, that you get to experience every day when you work with the federal government? Yeah, I think the first thing is, especially during crisis, right, people are looking for business insights. And, you know, the increase in sensors, you know, Matt was talking about, you know, using Zoom for the first time. And now you have a lot more mobile users. Well, the big problem that folks have in crisis is scale. Um, you know, if you have uh, everything on the data center floor and you run into a real issue, you can't go virtual, right? You have to ship in new equipment for scale and just getting the personnel there to, you know, make sure you have power drops and, and AC and other things ready to go. That's complicated. Whereas in the cloud, it's much more simplified. So uh, the ability to scale for unforeseen events, I think, is a key differentiator for Sumo Logic for sure. Um, you know, providing those business insights to sensors that you didn't even know were going to be there 30 days ago were very easy to deploy, uh, you know, super simple APIs um, that are already, you know, baked, whether that be, um, you know, Okta or Zoom, Salesforce, ServiceNow, uh, Zscale or Box, all of these online cloud companies already integrated with our technology. But I want to make this less about, you know, Sumo Logic and more about the event, right? Uh, at the end of the day, you know, I think crisis makes us better as a country. Um, I think, you know, the general is articulating that 
this crisis has made us better as a defense department. And all of us need to be able to learn how to work from home. And, and that's what we've run into, right? Nobody predicted this, but now we're being productive. In fact, many companies have those tailwinds and they're more productive, okay, online than they are with those companies that have the headwinds because they haven't prepared. No, I appreciate that. Uh, I was just looking down. I'm thinking of some, some, some notes and you're, you're, you're creating some light bulb moments for me. General, um, you know, at the heart of it, you, you know, a lot of your background addresses the R&D component, you know, and AI, while it's a thing we all kind of can comprehend and say, oh, it's the machines. And I think Joe pointed out, you know, ingenuity in the brain, it, it still matters, right? We are, the computers have not taken over the world yet, you know. Um, Doug, you spoke to that actionable intelligence that could exist in a cloud that can be leveraged, deciphered to help us make decisions quicker. General, can you speak a little bit to that symbiotic R&D, but operational you know, side of things in the military where you have to do the R&D because you're not just going to throw something out in, you know, in theater. So how do you maintain that balance, kind of having a foot in both camps? Sure. So, um, and that's a great lead in to where and why Army Futures Command was stood up uh, two, nearly two years ago now. So Army Future Command realized that we had this gap between kind of operational force and buying big six systems of record and then the, the research and development community. And there was this big gap in how do we accelerate this process between technology and reception creation and then the soldiers and how do we create that loop and make it faster and to learn. So uh, we in the AI Task Force are obviously a big part of that loop and understanding how, how we can use AI technologies um, to, to accelerate that part. And a lot of the key pieces, and we talked this already about the sensors and kind of building these infrastructures. I mean, and it doesn't matter if it's a healthcare system or electrical system or, or, or army systems. We have to build these infrastructures today so that when, when a crisis happens, we're ready and we can shift and adapt it quickly. And we can talk about a, a few great instances of that today. So for example, we, we have a medium altitude UAV called the Gray Eagle. Again, it was designed for um, the wars we've been fighting over the last two decades, fly it over Afghanistan, fly it over Iraq, but it's also useful for, for other things. You can fly it over, over our U.S. cities and look for disaster recovery. So a hurricane comes in, we fly it over, take pictures of the hurricane, we can get it up fast. Um, and again, it's, it's, it's lightweight, it's mobile. We, uh, last summer, we used it with the California National Guard in California looking at fire line detections. And then how, how do we get that technology adapt it and accelerate it so it's faster. So that when we get a, a, a data feed off of one of these edge devices, just like we get data off here off, off, of, a, off, a, off, a, off of a notebook or a, or a cell phone, how do we get that same type of, of data off of our Gray Eagle or other, or other devices? Um, another great example is our integrated visual augmentation system or, or our IVAS goggles. This is a new augmented reality system that we're, we're creating. Again, it was designed for traditional warfare type um, aspects. So we have it with our soldiers that has night vision capabilities on it. They're walking down a, a street that has natural, trans natural translation capabilities put in there, um, image detection capabilities. But we've, we've already used it for COVID because it's got a great thermal sensor into it. So you can go down and, and use it in hospitals and look at a person and say, and you can just very quickly say, yes, this soldier's uh, temperature is elevated. Um, the question then is how do we then take that data from these Internet of Things, again, Battlefield Internet of Things, or Industrial Internet of Things, and then get it into a format where we can get it into a cloud environment, do the analytics, and then get the data pushed back. For commercial cell phone companies, that's really easy to do right now. And that's been, been, been pushed for the last decade, and that's why I mean, all the big Internet providers, it's really easy to go out, the development environments, the deployment environments, all these kind of capabilities. How do we create those same kind of environments on our, our army systems or other DOD systems? And this is a big initiative with both within the Army AI Task Force as well as the Joint AI Center. Well, I'll, I mean, I'm thinking. I know, there was a lot there. So. No, no, no. I'm taking copious notes here in my head because, again, what an opportunity to share lessons learned, where you're going. And again, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. We got 450 agencies dealing with the same mandates, the policies. And when you hear, oh, a task force needed at the Department of Labor, or we can lean on guys like John and his, his world outside the Beltway as best practices. Yeah. So um, Sam, let me kick it over to you. Um, intergovernmental role, 
5G, you're involved with communications. Can you speak a little bit to, when you hear this, this incredibly passionate man and the general speak to, here's what we're doing, and, and he's, they're realizing in the military that uh, things aren't just purpose built, right? People like to say, well, we bought it for that, and then, oh man, we can use it for this. Can you speak to some of what GSA is encouraging through, you know, it's, it's let's call it uh, culture to say, hey, we have the answers, we have the solutions, we have resources for you. But um, speak to a little bit of that, if you can, in terms of how industry can leverage the GSA for some of this information sharing opportunity. Right. And, and I think our culture and our perspective, and in particular, the broader Federal Mobility Group perspective has been with the increased capacity within a mobile framework and, and in the mobile environment today as we move towards 5G is how do we add more sensors or more capabilities to the network, right? And in a more efficient and rapid manner. You know, before the mobile grid was really seen as having two kind of uh, functionalities, right? The ability to, to talk or the ability to, to, to listen, right? Whether you tick text uh, data or, 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 um, or, or phone capability. And um, I think moving forward is, and in particular at the onset of this uh, pandemic, we've seen, can we get the answers off of the systems that we have in place on the mobile network today? Great example is uh, right off the beginning, we were trying to limit access to federal buildings. One thing folks may not know is that GSA is, is the largest landlord outside of DOD uh, for, for federal space. Well, you know, what is the grid telling us on the utilization of those federal spaces? And are we moving folks rapidly enough to a mobile environment? Uh, thermal analytics is another great example, you know, whereas before to place thermal analytic uh, uh, hardware on the network and provision those would have been more of a, of a high level effort on the wireline network it's a lot more seamless and a lot more straightforward on the wireless network. And so I think the approach really has been twofold. First and foremost is how can we use the capabilities that we have today and what are they telling us? And can we use a cognitive capability embedded in that to give us some knowledge on what the environment is telling us? And then secondly, how can we let rapidly deploy um, capabilities on a wireless network that now has faster data rates, um, lower latency, and, and really can drive a lot of the results. No, thanks, Sam. And, and again, you hit on words like cognitive and, you know, again, people think of the GSA. The GSA, to me, is the, the, the uh, resource of resources. Not only do they have contract vehicles to get to this type of expertise, but they have the guidance to help say, hey, if you're going to invest in you know, the cloud or a cybersecurity solution, you know, there, there are things you need to think about. And Sam, I know you do that so well, and so do your colleagues. So again, think of the GSA as that resource for their thinking for a lot of the agencies as they deploy and integrate new technologies. Joe, you know, we're talking about this sensors and the information in real time, and I think of hospitals and yes, COVID, but even just so much data, and it's not about the privacy. I don't want to go down that, that rabbit hole. That could be an hour or two in discussion, but can you speak to some of, for example, or two of, of how you're seeing this explosion of data, but also the ability to distill it and, and you know, cure disease and, and some of the rapid advancement that would get somebody excited about, you know, what we're doing in this country with technology to improve health? Well, uh, the general ended up mentioning uh, infrared lenses and cameras. That's one of the technologies that are going to be used widely in the near future. It was actually kind of funny. I got a text from Craig earlier about how do we get one of the uh, army drones that are already being done at the unit level for infrared cameras. Uh, it, again, Craig being a former naval aviator and myself being in the in the Air Force, still in the reserves, we try to get the toys where we can. But the camera systems on those are tremendously useful for immediate screening. And when you think of that, it's not just at a hospital. It's how do we get that technology to the patient and then be able to help them with their families so that they can actually figure out where their risk is or who do they need to stay a little bit further from so that they can keep themselves healthier longer. And that's where we really do want the pivot. Right now, the doctor is viewed as the medical expert, and that's not going to change. Doctors are going to be the medical expert, but how do we distill some of their knowledge down to individuals so they can make wiser decisions every day? Mm. It's the current issues we have with COVID, 
a future problem that we're going to have, or just the routine things of helping take care of your parents as they get elderly. Um, I happen to be very fortunate. My grandmother just recently turned 97 years old, and but she still insists on living on her own. My mother has asked for her to move in. Everybody in the family has been like, you're, you're getting a little bit older, we're a little bit more concerned. But how do we, instead of try to encourage her to live with us, allow her to stay in place? And many don't realize in the VA, we actually provide benefits for veterans who are at those levels, who are aging in place and want to have, have specific disability ratings, how can we help and monitor them, not only as us as the healthcare entity, but as their family? Um, there's been many studies done, some collaborating between VA and Intel. I mean, we're talking over 10 years ago now, where you found out that you didn't have to put cameras everywhere. You could do passive sensing so that you're not compromising privacy and you're not getting any type of imaging, but you're allowing the family to understand, did they get out of bed? Did they go eat? Did they go do stuff? So that you can reduce that paranoia and worry, and worry that a family might have by knowing that that person is around and active. But how do you distill that data and how do you refine it so that you can ensure that they're not just going to the refrigerator, but they're eating a healthy diet? Mm. So that's where we're trying to get to the next generation of those smart home technologies that are out there. Joe, thanks for humanizing that. Um, I mean, I have, you know, I lost my father last year. You know, my mother is, God bless her, doing well, but I, I worry. I worry she's older, she's 80, and she's in a home by herself, you know, that we grew up in, and you think about things. So that, that was awesome. Thank you for sharing. John, um, let's get to you and your critical infrastructure perspective. You referenced things like the, the sensing with pro, program logic controllers. And in the world of the water sector, the energy sector, the transportation sector, there's a lot of remote connectivity, wired to Sam's point and wireless, advanced metering. Um, can you, you know, give us a sense of where that your sector's going and how it's embracing technology and using some of this to make that information, whether it's applied or actionable? Yes, uh, and I think that um, I, I spent a lot of time in the financial services, and they were way ahead of everybody because that's where the money was, right? But the same Literally. thing is happening now in, in the utilities where they're really adopting these sensors, being able to collect information. I call it the Delta T goes to zero, and the Delta S goes to zero. Tighter and tighter time frames, broader and broader areas that you start monitoring and you start looking. So when you get a damage, damage assessment, maybe General Easley's drone would fly over, find some damage. How do you deal with it? How do you get it into your system, analyze the overall impact, and then do an analysis of the consequences of what that's going to mean, and so that you can do uh, allocation decisions, et cetera. So it's the whole idea of how to take that system, a systems approach, and really be able to ingest that data from increasingly more dense sensors of multiple types. We talked about multispectral. There's a, a capability in the water industry to use satellites to look down and spot where there are potential leaks in the water system just because of the moisture that's being detected from the satellite. So these mm. are some, normally you'd have to send crews out, you'd have to spend a lot of time, you'd have to be digging holes, you'd be doing a lot of this. So the whole idea is to be able to leverage everything from the technology, from the computation, from being able to collect a lot more data. Uh, another example in sensing, uh, when you go to sense for voltage and frequency on an electric grid, or when you go for a water hammer or transients in a water system, uh, the, all of the sensors and the capabilities now have made one and two-fold increases in the sampling rate so that you're actually able to pick up things that you never were able to see before. So you can see transients, uh, bridges on highways, okay, used to be just concrete and steel, but now you're able to use techniques such as LIDAR, you're able to use other techniques to determine what the strength stress impact on that bridge is, stress reversal for fatigue, stuff like this. So the, the areas where the application of technologies, a lot more data is just being used. So we go from what we call situation awareness to situation assessment, and then down the road to situation anticipation. Really what I call in the military, 
a true running estimate of the situation ahead of the headlights or outside in the headlights. And you keep trying to project those headlights out further, if that metaphor makes sense. Man, that was crystal. I'm stealing some of that, but I'll always give credit for you uh, to you for that. No, that was a wonderful picture's worth a thousand words, mental picture. You know, what I appreciated um, about where you're going and understanding some of these sectors, I mean, your example of satellites detecting through imagery, you know, potentially risk, physical risk, I mean, think about how powerful that is in light of some things that have happened recently with, with the dams in our country. And of course, you can go to the acts of God and see what happened when superstorms hit here, there, and everywhere. We weren't prepared. Resilience has been a word that I think is in tandem with every bit of this volume, velocity, variety, veracity of data that to Joe's point and our colleagues have said, you can collect it. You know, I'm, Doug can wax poetic on the cloud and its ability to scale, but distilling it and then gleaning from it yeah. opportunities to create a resilient network. Yeah, Doug, you were gonna say something? Yeah, I, I just wanted to add. So John, I mean, you really identified um, business insights that need that are needed and, and maybe even the decisions that you make as you progress to a solution. Um, we're actually demonstrating that with uh, the leadership of NIST under a CRADA for the industrial internet of things. Um, at University of Maryland, thermal power, wind power, um, and solar power, Panels are all being used uh, to, to build out uh, a sample and to try to make some recommendation to industry. So the Industrial Internet of Things CRADA um, will be identifying, will, will be a study that will be identifying recommended solutions. Um, and remember how power works. So if you wanted to you know, put a solar power on your house, you know, the electric company has to allow you to do that. And that's a new device on their electric grid. So how do you protect those things? And those are some of the insights that Sumo Logic is able to provide uh, at a massive scale. Um, I'll just mention, you know, one of our largest customers, is Samsung, globally, um, all the IoT pieces that they're working with. So we can handle that, those insights for you. Just wanted to, to mention that. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, just really quick, I want to emphasize, John, one sec, that the CRADA, the Cooperative Research and Development Agreement, um, what an opportunity in industry, obviously Sumo Logic with the NIST and others, you know, to embrace. And we can probably share after this, you know, opportunities to engage in those types of partnerships. Because to the general's point, Joe's point, there's rapid acceleration of innovation. And we're not waiting for standards much anymore today because the technology pace is outpacing the time it takes to do that. So take advantage of great opportunities. John? Just, just to extend a little bit on that, too recognize that those technologies are pretty different and how they interact. It's like taking a whole bunch of new recruits, throwing them into a place, and then trying to make a team out of them real quickly. So there's that issue of, yeah, you get the data, you get the interfaces, but you got to learn how each one of those plays with the other in a holistic way, which is really challenging. And the one thing you mentioned about data, and I think uh, Joe mentioned, uh, alluded to it, and I had a chuckle a little, he was talking about data filters. And I was thinking, well, why would you want to filter data? Well, but it isn't exactly that. 80% uh, of the data that's collected in, let's say, a water system using SCADA and all of that, the control system, is unused. Only 20% of it gets used today. So that's a challenge to the people out there. How do I make I'm collecting the data. How do I make more use of it or I just get rid of it, which is probably not the case because it probably would fill in at a certain time in a future computational capability to be able to tell you things, talk to you and tell you how that system is working. Yeah, I can't resist the pay by the drink, but let's just leave that <laughs> as I'm not a comedian. But yeah, I think we've learned that you know bandwidth and we, we provision a lot for that scaling need of a disaster that could happen yet with the elasticity of cloud and things we still have to figure out how to architect that i'm going to start here with sam i got a question from the audience we've got about 16 minutes say 15 and we have to reserve time for parting shots so for our awesome speakers the question to each of you we're going to go around the horn here starting with sam is and the question comes from our colleague mr george seffers what is a lesson learned, if any, and it doesn't have to be dramatic, that, that the COVID-19, the pandemic, the epidemic, what is a lesson learned in each of your agencies 
that you've you know had an opportunity to 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 leverage as a light bulb moment of how to you know improve the way you're doing your work sam well i just want to use this opportunity to give a shout out to all of our industry partners i think our biggest lesson learned up front as we rolled out programs such as the deep pass program and and other capabilities to rapidly have the ability to uh get our hands on the, the technological solutions that we wanted was that uh, getting industry involved up front um, was very refreshing to see how transparent uh, a lot of our partners were and how they found the solution a lot of times before we could in government to help us procure the capabilities we needed quickly. And then secondly, I just want to tie into John's last effort. It definitely was um, about a game about how quickly we could turn data to knowledge, knowledge that's actually usable for leadership to execute and make decisions on. And um, part and parcel with that is was not only the data and the sensors and the different capabilities we had, but ensuring that it was secure was key to that. And a lot of the work that NIST was doing way in advance to this crisis kind of helped grease the skids for ensuring that things were mud compliant, for example, and that remote key uh, bootable infrastructure were being used for IoT environments and things of that nature. So definitely just to kind of conclude, one just really was an awe to the in innovative idea and approach that industry took to embracing the crisis and helping government uh, gain access to the capabilities we needed. And then secondly, a lot of the work that was done before the crisis that kind of came full circle once this thing came uh, full headwind uh, to us, which helped us answer the question on whether these capabilities were secure or not to use for government uh, to leverage uh, and, and benefit the taxpayer. Thank you, Sam. I love the turning data to knowledge and securing it. Great sound by General. Lessons learned. Uh, lesson learned is, is, is kind of this, again, this interaction between our technology and our culture and how we can use how the the cloud technology, the, our internet system, all these technologies come together to allow the Army and the Department of Defense to be more flexible, that we can adapt and change much more rapidly than we could 20 years ago to, to face new crises. Um, so again, we, we knew we had to get to the social distancing technique just to protect the force, but we knew we still had wars to fight. We still have, I mean, we have to get people out the door I mean, we have to send people to Afghanistan and to Iraq and, and get them back, get aircraft carriers out the door and get them back. And how do we do that safely? How do we quarantine the, our, our soldiers and sailors? How do we understand I mean, all these pieces that need to still come together to be able to fight our missions? And, and technology has dramatically allowed us to do that much more efficiently because we know we, we don't know what the next crisis is gonna be. And that we have to build that infrastructure, those tools, that adaptability, both in our technology and in our workforce, today to be um, adaptable for our, our future missions. Love it, I st I'm stealing the adaptability, flexibility, and safely leveraging tech to, to enhance mission. Awesome. Joe. Well, from the lessons learned perspective, we have to not forget what we've done in the past and what we've learned. As I said, we've had a huge push for telework, telehealth, virtual positioning in VA but there are some positions that did not have those quick telehealth executions. Uh, people who did not have laptops, iPads and iPhones readily available at first. So even though we've had the push for going on over a decade to my knowledge, and I know some people will say even longer than that, we did have to make purchases under the special funding to buy over a hundred thousand uh, pieces of equipment. And we should always be having that as a standard so that people are ready to move. However, I'll also give a warning. Um, we're very good, and to use the military adage, we're really good at fighting the last war. So there are standards out there right now for self-healing mesh networks, for 5G to actually have tower-to-tower -to -tower communication so you can have locality with caching data. This type of stuff, if this was a different type of incident or it was an incident that was being more restrictive to our population, we wouldn't have been able to send as many people out to maintain the wires, to maintain stuff. So those new technologies are probably going to have to be looked at even more closely. And we within VA have been looking at those to have the capabilities so that we could act in a more disastrous situation if necessary. 
Great answer, Joe. And again, uh, uh, you know, foundational tools. We have to have the most basic thing to communicate. This world we live in is you can have the coolest iPhone. And like I say, if your Wi-Fi ain't that great, you're going to blame the phone. You got to think about stuff you don't see. But foundational tools, standards matter. And I think to your point, hey, if you all want to get really smart, right, not you, but our audience, just go to your favorite search engine and, and look up NIST and all the wonderful research that's being done today and every day and pick a topic. So Joe, great point to drive home the standards and point, uh, you know, perspective. John, lessons yeah, learned. Uh, this one, this pandemic, we could roll back to uh, Hurricane Maria and its impact on Puerto Rico. You can start to put the two together and start to see patterns beginning to emerge in that regard. And in this particular case, I think what this has done is highlighted the fact that when you're thinking, you have to think very boldly because you got to think beyond what the normal, the normal actually is, even in a disaster situation. So how you scope something and how you really go down deep into the tracing, the impacts, the secondary and the tertiary effects. For example, uh, we got locked down, no transportation, no transportation, no gas, no gas, no ethanol production, no ethanol. We lost our CO2 capability. So it impacted our food, it impacted our water systems, and it impacted our beer production too. So as you go along, you, you start to see these don't know what you don't know type of situations. So how do you use data in a better way? How do you use computational capabilities in a better way to be able to tease this stuff out from your ongoing situation. Uh, so I think the whole idea of, of combining data and also having new models, new models of thought in terms of how you would do the simulations, perhaps. We've looked at living systems, perhaps. Different metaphors for how you would uh, deal with this. Yeah, you know, I'm gonna uh, take away from that, um, this idea of scoping and impact, but you used a word and someone else did as well that I find so relevant and whether you're a cybersecurity strategist or you're a policy analyst, consequence, effect and consequence. We don't know in some cases what we don't know. We don't know when we're trying a new, in this case it'd be COVID, it could be a, you know, a vaccine, it could be a new device that's taking pictures, but we have to always, I think you'd all agree, that we have to be thinking about what's the consequences of, of it not giving us what we need. What could it cause? And that gets to risk mitigation when we talk about sensors and IoT. So I love that you mentioned that. That's what I took away. And I, I appreciate that consequence effect picture for me. Doug? Yeah, sure. I, I would say um, really all the panelists have highlighted you know, technology and the human interface. So on the human side of it, what we've learned is um, you know, the, the increased activities for the SOC, uh, the Security Operations Center, with network changes. And, you know, technologies can help prioritize those real events that should, they should be spending their time with, rather than being confused by lots of signals happening at the same time. You can't imagine the number of changes that some of the SOCs have experienced. Um, again, you know, uh, the technology is there uh, that allows you to prioritize those areas that should have focus. And I think that's one of the lessons learned from our customers. Well, that word is huge. Resilience, prioritization, distilling the data to Joe's point. We can all agree. Again, there's, there's a, just a, so much data out there. I like to think of putting on my old you know, ping power pipe you know, when I ran a data center. I learned so much about you can have you know, a concern in your network, but some devices are less risky than others. And whether it's the firewall or back in the day, the one router to the outside world, you have to know how to prioritize. And in this world where everything's sort of meshed and disconnected, you still need to do that. It's just a bit harder. So great points there, Mr. Doug. Okay. Yeah, well, you have, you know, you have the friendly changes or there's the people coming onto the network to do, let's say, work from home or what have you. Um, and then you have those, you know, the, the, those adversaries that uh, shouldn't be there, right? Yep. Okay, we, this is the fireside, you know, if you will, quick fire. So 30 seconds or less, please. This is the, uh, what do you want somebody to tweet or think about or say, man, when the general said that, it hit home for me and I'm sucking some air out so you can start getting those neurons firing. Um, I'm going to start with Sam. You've done this before, my friend, but what do you want to leave with the audience um, from today's discussion? Um, the future is now. Uh, 
I think this crisis has provided us insight on where we could get better and where we can incorporate emerging technologies now, uh, not three to five years from now. And so just, I think, thinking about rethinking the way we do our, our mission right now is the best time, the most optimal time to submit a use case, a business case to your leadership that answers a lot of the challenges we're dealing with today. Amen. Reimagine in a crisis situation and the future's now. Love it. General. Yeah, I, I would concur. It's now. We have to take action now on how to use data, how to use technology to make our forces more ready. Um, we, we know we have I mean, this, this greatest military in the, the world, but we know we have to adapt it quickly to this, these new environments. Um, and we don't know what that environment is going to be. So this is why we have to use technology and just be, as we prepare, think how do we fight the different fights we have to fight? How do we do the different missions? Be it humanitarian disaster relief one, COVID support, hurricane support, any of these types of missions where our, our National Guard forces, our, our team is asked to, to support our country. And how do we use that technology? How do we use our cell phones? How do we use our, the computers we made out of our home? How do we make these systems more adaptable today so we can, we can get more, more value from each of our, our, um, our service members? Amen. Taking action and being adaptable and, you know, adaptability in those products that we purchase. Good shout out and in industry. Think about that as well. Joe. Don't tell me how you can work with me. Show me. We have a VHA innovation sandbox. So anyone who goes to Google, VHA innovation sandbox should come up with the first results being our wiki and a self-registration capability that has test data and test systems for everything we have behind our firewall. So you can actually show me how you can utilize our, the data we already have to make impacts and change. And we typically have between 100 and 150 companies going through there to show us what they can do. But also, I hate to take a little bit more here, do your research. Don't come to us and ask us the kindergarten questions that you can look up on NIST for FEMA, for FIPS and FISMA and understand what security levels we need for what. I can tell you outright for patient care, we need FISMA high. I need the highest level of security and highest level of data assurance that we can actually regulate that life safety device. Joe, I have so much there that was tweetable, but I love from uh, maybe Jerry Maguire was show me the money and you said, I think it's show me the insights because you have plenty of data for them to distill and Amen on the sandbox. I think every agency that has one, and I'm sure they do encourage industry to come. Industry wants to come. They don't always want to sell. They want to show. So awesome, awesome parting shot there. You all have them. John. Yeah, I just as want, wanted to say, uh, as having been on both sides of the fence, I think that the critical infrastructures and supply chains are as important as they are in the, as what the military actually is. Uh, I will say, though, that they have become so complex that they exceed really the human capacity, just even a team capacity. So the areas there would be how to take complex and how to interact with technology and actually interact with technology, not only individual managers, but also in teams to be able to properly manage, to, to be able to understand and, and take the appropriate action as we deploy. Uh, I could come up with several cases that have taken place during a pandemic where technology could have been used in a more effective manner. Awesome. Doug, close us out. So a little comedy, right? Um, I'd like one of those drones that the general's got. That's number one. <laughs> Want to fly one at least. Um, and then second, just, you know, uh, technology moves fast. And your current provider might not be able to provide, you know, the scale and capabilities, the insights that you need. So please do your research. You know, there are folks that can be agile, can move quickly, and that can help. Awesome. Well, I'm going to finish with, it was a pleasure. Uh, I was educated. I was informed. I was enlightened. I hope our audience was, it well, was as well. I want to thank Tom Suter in the ATAR community, Kirsten, obviously General, Sam, Joe, John, Doug, your insights are invaluable and thank you again. And we uh, hope to get together and do this at another time. So thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you everybody. Thank you, Peter. Thanks everyone.